Thank you, uh, Manuela, and thanks everyone for joining us. There are uh, about 400 of you registered for this today on a hot, hazy, humid summer afternoon. At least it's hazy, hot, and humid uh, here. And what better way to cool off with the refreshing taste of a withering torrent of pie charts and bar graphs, which is the promise that you have today. So at Sounds Profitable, we have released a number of studies, all in service of moving the podcast community and the podcast industry forward. And much of the work that we have done has been focused on consumer perceptions, consumer perceptions of advertising, of different kinds of advertising execution, uh, brand safety, and other things that really benefit from the viewpoint of the listener, the, the folks that we are trying to serve with our content. But by popular request, from uh, the over 130 partners that we currently have now at Sounds Profitable, many of you wanted to know, well, how are we doing? How are we doing with buyers? How are we doing with the agencies and the brands and the planners that buy what we're doing, that, uh, that place ads and use podcasting as an ad vehicle and, and put food on our families, as, uh, as W once said. So this project really is our first effort to do that and to do that at scale, to really determine how are we doing with the buying community? What are their perceptions of podcast advertising? How does podcasting fit into what they're doing? Uh, where does it not fit into what they're doing? And more importantly, what can we do to get more people to buy podcasts and to, and to really see the power of it? So that's what today's project is really all about. And uh, it, as with many of the projects that we have done here at Sounds Profitable, uh, it takes a village. And this one absolutely took a village. And before I get into the data, I do want to acknowledge all of the folks who helped us uh, put this together. So certainly our sponsors for this study. And, uh, you know, when in a study like this, people sometimes sponsor a research project for thought leadership purposes, for marketing purposes to get their name out there. But I really want to commend the companies that, that helped bring this to you because this data is for you. This data is for the benefit of the industry. It does not happen without the support of companies like this uh, who really selflessly in a lot of ways support all of this to make it possible for you. So uh, so I want to thank BetterHelp. I want to thank SXM Media, Barometer, Wondery, Audiohook, uh, NPR, ESPN Podcasts, and SoundRise for helping to sponsor this important piece of work. And I also want to call out two other companies here without whom this would not be possible. Uh, and the first is Digiday. We worked in partnership with Digiday for part of this research to access their panel of buyers so that we could augment what we were doing and, and be sure that we were getting a really broad spread and a really representative spread of agency and brand buyers. And the second company, of course, uh, are our research partners at Signal Hill Insights. They have been invaluable to us in uh, shaping the direction of this, uh, helping to write the questionnaire, uh, fielding this to a, a, a fantastic panel of B2B buyers to, to really round out the sample um, and helping with the analysis and, and really helping to make all of this possible. Because again, this project is for you. It's, it is for all of us. So just to talk a little bit about what we're going to see here. Uh, in the past couple of months, we worked with both Digiday and Signal Hill Insights to look at the current perceptions of podcast advertising with a broad sample. We talked to over 300 buyers and how that is sort of all parsed out. We talked to 293 people quantitatively in, in survey form. Uh, about a third of them came from Digiday's panel and another 200 verified buyers were sourced uh, from a reputable B2B panel by our, our partners at Signal Hill Insights. And those two panels blended together really, really well. I think we spent a lot of time making sure the data looked right. We also did a series of qualitative interviews with 11 people who are buyers in the podcast space who are really veteran buyers. They have really been there, many of them, since the very, very beginning. Uh, and I think it's best to, to look at some of these insights. Uh, sometimes they are reflective of the broader industry, but many times they are kind of the tip of the spear. These are the people that have been through uh, more than most in terms of buying uh, podcasts and some of the frustrations they may have had and some of what they're seeing in the industry. So whether they're tip of the spear or uh, for a less violent analogy, canaries in a coal mine, I guess that's violent too for the canary. Um, we wanted to be sure to preserve some of those insights. So uh, so we have some qualitative insights spread out through here from a panel that we're calling Sounds Profitable Insiders. They're people you know from companies you love and trust. So let's just take a really quick look at who we talked to so that you have a sense of that. 
Uh, we asked people, how many years have you worked in the advertising industry? And this, of course, is across both brand and agency. Uh, the majority here are less than nine years in the space, but there's a fairly good spread of really veteran buyers uh, and people that are new to the industry. We did spend some time looking at the differences here between how veteran in, uh, industry insiders feel about some of these questions compared to uh, rookies or, or people fairly new to the business. And uh, a couple of things. Number one, it played out exactly as you might expect. The longer you've been in the industry, the more knowledge you had about some of the things that we talk about. Uh, but I'm not really going to show you a lot of that because it's not necessarily actionable for us in the industry. We can't control HR practices at our buyers, right? Uh, so we're going to focus on some other things, uh, especially really, I think, the relationship between agency buyers and brand buyers, whether they're working with an agency or working direct. In terms of the a job title of the folks that we talked to, again, this broader sample of about 300 buyers. There are brand marketers, executives, uh, buyers, and planners in this mix. Uh, and again, we looked at a whole variety of uh, responses from them in terms of the, how long they've been in the business and uh, where they're employed and things like that. And I, I think we've got some really solid insights to show you. In terms of the type of organization of the folks that we talked to, 44% uh, worked at an agency. And then another 40% here are with a brand. They're either uh, direct buyers themselves of podcast advertising, or they work with an agency. And a few places today, I'm going to show you some of the differences between agency buyers and brand buyers. And that's really that 44% on the left and the 40% here uh, combining the direct buyers and the agency buyers at brands. So, and there's a few interesting differences. Uh, we asked people about their plans in terms of buying podcast advertising? Have they purchased it before? Are they purchasing it this year? 35% are currently buying. They are buying them this year. So more than a third are buying podcast ads this year. Uh, another 35% say they plan to. And we, we took a look at them and they really track sort of behaviorally and from a, a knowledge standpoint, they track very similarly to the people that don't buy. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. But in terms of the current buyers, again, 35% not buying this year, but have bought previously 13%, which again, with our sample size is a pretty good uh, block to look at. And then finally, 17% say they have never bought podcast ads. And I wanted to break this out here by agency employees and direct brand employees, because there are, are really a couple of interesting things. Um, now, first of all, you're always going to have uh, agencies outpace brands here because agencies are buying all kinds of advertising for all kinds of brands. So it's unsurprising that uh, the percentage of agency employees that indicate they're currently buying podcast ads is higher. Uh, although I would submit that's quite a gap, right? 46% of agency employees say that they're buying podcasts this year compared to 28% on the brand side. That's quite a gap. And then another gap is all the way on the right, have never bought podcast ads. Uh, and advertisers, brand employees uh, reporting on this survey are twice as likely to say that they have never bought podcast ads. And again, I think that's that's tremendous opportunity for us. So let's look at the experience of buying podcasts. And uh, this has really been a wonderful project because we've had the opportunity to look at all of this quantitative data with a with a really significant sample of buyers, but also cross-reference it and map it to some of the qualitative insights that we got from our veteran panel of Sounds Profitable Insiders. And you'll see a little bit of that as we go forward. So I showed you this graph before. This is the uh, company's current experience with buying podcast ads. In order to look at the experience of buying podcast ads, we need to look at the people who have that experience. So uh, for the next series of graphs, we're really going to focus on the people currently buying podcast ads and the people that have at least previously bought them even if they're not buying them this year. So starting with the people who are currently buying podcast ads, we asked them what overall percentage of your media spend is allocated to podcasts. Uh, and just sort of breaking this out right down the middle, 55%, uh, a little more than half, spend less than 20% of their total spend, and 45% are spending more than 20%. And if that seems high to you, I want to point out two things here because uh, you know we found this completely plausible. Number one, remember, these are the people currently buying podcast advertising, right? So uh, the 65% of buyers in our sample who are not currently buying, they're not spending anything. So those would be zeros that would be averaged into this uh, if we were reporting this on the total. And then second, 
I think the fact that 45% say they're spending more than 20% is indicative of the types of buyers that are currently buying podcasting, right? What we're not looking at here is a wide range of most buyers spending some percentage on podcasting. We're still looking at about a third of buyers in this sample uh, spending a lot, which tells me uh, certainly on the brand side that you have a lot of brands that are maybe exclusive to podcasting or spending a lot on podcasting. And some of the top brands in podcast advertising do in fact do that. Or there are a lot of agencies in our sample that are heavily weighted towards podcast advertising because they have spent the time uh, to learn more about optimizing the medium, about how to buy it effectively. So to me, this is, uh, on the one hand, this may seem high to you, but I think it's completely plausible uh, as a reflection of who's buying podcasting now. And I think in the future, a goal would be to get these percentages uh, maybe down a bit if that means that you know, 100% of buyers are buying podcasting or, or at least uh, the majority. So something to look for in the future. Now we ask people who are currently buying or have previously bought podcasts. Again, the percentage of the sample that have experience here, we gave them a number of statements and we asked them how much they agreed or disagreed with each one of these. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some of the agreement ones here. These are ranked in order of agreement uh, and just a couple of things about this. So. A lot of what's happening right now with podcast buying, as I just showed you, is that we do have uh, a minority of agencies and brands that are buying a lot of it, and then a majority that aren't choosing to this year. So when you see things like this, when you see a lot of people agreeing with statements like, I'm comfortable with brand safety and suitability in podcasting, that's a reflection of the people currently buying. If they weren't comfortable, they wouldn't be buying. And with a study like this, where we're really looking at a sophisticated uh, experienced panel of buyers, I think it's important to look at the small numbers too, because those represent the edges and it's where the friction happens is at the edges. And so uh, everything that happens at the edges is a limiting factor, I think, in the uh, increased adoption of buying podcast advertising. So keep that in mind. But in terms of the current and previous buyers, the people with experience, there's broad agreement that they're comfortable with brand safety that they're satisfied with the targeting tools, and I'll have more to say about that in a moment, that podcast advertising is more engaging, and that they're able to justify a podcast spend through measured attribution, right? Where you start to see uh, a little, uh, a bit less kind of enthusiasm and agreement on this second page here, uh, it's harder to skip ads in podcasts than most other media. 68% agree with that, but you do start to see some friction at the edges. Podcasting is easy to buy, uh, we'll have a few things to say about that in a moment. The ad environment is uncluttered. And then the measurement tools in podcasting are robust. Uh, and this is the one that really had the most uh, disagreement or at least uh, neutral position, right? The measurement tools in podcasting are robust. And I think some of the perceptions here uh, really come through when we talk to our Sounds Profitable insiders. And these are some direct quotes. And really, I love this first one. There's no one source of truth. So you need to reconcile multiple data sources. Another one of our insiders said, another challenge was the efficacy of different measurement processes and how they felt that sometimes they weren't the most accurate or even the most effective. Uh, and then finally, I would add on a long-term basis, uh, like uh, marketing mixed modeling, multi-touch attribution, but for campaigns, they don't help you. If Amazon or Google had acquired pod sites instead of Spotify, I think we could get better iterations on what we currently have. And I, I know a lot of you have uh, felt that, I think, when Spotify purchased pod sites and, and Chartable. So we heard, we heard this a lot, again, from the really experienced buyers about this kind of metrics friction. Now, in terms of the differences between agencies and advertisers, I, I point this out to show you that really amongst experienced buyers, they weren't that different. You can see very few of these exhibit any kind of significant differences in agreement. The agency and advertiser experienced buyer of podcasting uh, are all fairly in line with at least these four perceptions. And really, you don't see anything significant in terms of uh, differentiation until you get to page two, where you see less agreement on the brand or advertiser uh, on their behalf about how robust the measurement tools in podcasting are. And I think that's certainly something that uh, you know, agency employees may have a, a little bit more experience with perhaps than than some of the folks on the brand side, but that was really the most significant difference that we saw in agreement. But I want to share with you the things that people disagreed about. And again, as I mentioned, because what we are talking about here 
is a uh, a minority of buyers that are spending a lot on podcasting uh, with the majority in this sample not buying them this year. It's important, I think, for us to look at the disagreement, at the friction on the edges, because these are the rate limiting factors. And we'll start at the top here. Uh, and really, this disagreement was shared equally between agency and advertiser buyers. The ad environment in podcasts is uncluttered. And that's something that when we talked to our uh, our panel of Sounds Profitable insiders, we heard reflected in a couple of different ways. We heard it's difficult for brands to walk in the footsteps of Athletic Greens, Manscaped, BetterHelp, and other brands that have made their names clear in podcast advertising. The limited inventory on shows, and there are limited shows that work for particular types of brands and products. One of the things that I'll point out here, which of course, uh, the folks from Athletic Greens, Manscaped, and uh, BetterHelp, who uh, was one of the sponsors of this project, know is that they worked very hard on optimizing those campaigns. They've done a significant amount of uh, work, both on the data science side and also in the, on the brand lift side. They are doing the work to make those campaigns work. So it's more than just uh, being able to kind of plant your flag and say first. Um, but as other people pointed out, the efficiency of share of voice shows has dipped. And I now hear six ads in an episode. And as a listener, I hated the ads on a podcast last night. The more brands enter the space, the less efficient the system becomes and the less we can pay podcasters. So there's a little bit of friction there, I think, in terms of uh, the clutter. Um, and, you know, I don't think the clutter is something, and this is work that I've done in the past on other on other studies, don't think it's something that en masse the listeners perceive yet, but we are certainly seeing some spot loads increase. Another perception here with similar disagreement, uh, podcasting is easy to buy. And again, uh, podcasting is easy to buy for those who think it is easy to buy. But once you get into the more experienced buyers, some of the, the people that we talk to in our qualitative research, you do start to see uh, a little bit of the, uh, again, the, the friction around the edges. Um, and some of that, I think, is related to how much the technology has kept pace with the growth in uh, the audience, right? The ad tech. The biggest challenge for podcasting right now is how fast the technology has grown and how slowly the technology has grown with it. And this is really, I think, ad tech specific. Third-party tracking and targeted podcast buying are helping solve some of these problems, but they're not solutions yet. And, and another insider pointed out that the biggest thing we're running into right now is inventory volatility because of the aggregation of companies because of that. When I RFP something, get it back, put together a plan, get the client to approve it, the inventory might not be there anymore. Um, and some of the other, I think, uh, ad tech and efficiency related comments, a big challenge coming from an ad buying perspective is that as a buyer, when we want frequency capping, we have to ask the network to do that. And they're controlling that rather than us having the dial and the switch to turn things on or turn things down. Uh, and then finally, on this topic, growth is just an outcome of good efficiency at the end of the day. And if we're saying we want to get to 4 billion, I assume most of us do, we're probably looking at it the wrong way. We need to improve the efficiencies that already exist for the brands that are in this space. And uh, I'll have a little bit more to say about that later, because I, I think it's an, uh, an interesting dichotomy between how some of the earliest buyers who really supported this space from close to the beginning feel uh, about these tools compared to people that are just coming into it now. Uh, back to things that people disagree with. I point this out because it was the biggest difference between agency buyers and brand side buyers. Uh, and that is it's harder to skip ads in podcasts than most other media, uh, more brand side buyers feel that. And this is something that uh, over the years, uh, you know, 19 years now that I've been researching podcasting, uh, it's it's a thing that we hear about ad skipping and and how much of a problem it may or may not be. And you know, I've researched it uh, to some extent, don't think we've looked at it recently. And I do think it's worth looking at. So it's it's being added, maybe not to the front burner here at Sounds Profitable, but it's on the it is on the warmer burner, the one that sits immediately behind uh, the front burner on your on your podcast data stove. So I think I do think we will get to that. What's kind of difficult from uh, a measurement perspective is that ad skipping is not measured the same way with every kind of medium, right? With uh, with podcasting, you can ask people about ad skipping. But people are very aspirational about things like that. They will tell you that they skip ads or avoid ads a lot more than they actually do. Uh, and then you look at things like broadcast radio. Broadcast radio uh, could be measured to that extent. You could be able to to tell ad skipping, but the way it's reported, uh, it's measured in quarter hours. And if you 
you know, if you in a quarter hour, if you listen to uh, Lion Eyes by the Eagles for five or six minutes and then turn the station, you get credit in the ratings for all 15 minutes, even if you skipped all of the spots that that followed it. So all of these things are measured slightly differently. However, I do think it's something that that we should uh, poke around at because I, I actually think podcasting would look very good here, uh, despite uh, what some in a minority might uh, proclaim to be an issue. Um, and then this kind of second page of disagreement, the only thing I really want to point out here that is the other significant difference between agency buyers and brand side buyers is I'm satisfied with the targeting tools available in podcasting and brand side buyers were twice as likely to disagree with that. And this, I think, is an instance where it's education as much as anything. Uh, you know, some of the things I believe that we're talking about are innovations that we need in ad tech innovations uh, on the publisher side and on the brand side. But in this particular case, uh, I think this is probably an education issue because we asked about this. What methods have you used for audience targeting with podcast ads? And the majority of buyers say that they've used some kind of first party data, whether that's demographics provided by the publisher or some kind of audience segment product that's provided by the by the publisher or an ad tech partner. Uh, and then another 46% have used some kind of third party segmentation tool like uh, Comscore or Nielsen. So, you know, the, a slight majority have used these things. And when you ask people, how satisfied are you with the audience targeting methods that you've, uh, that you've made use of amongst the people that have used them? You know, people are pretty happy with them. There's very little, uh, even neutral sentiment here, let alone disagreement. Uh, most people, I think, are, are very or somewhat satisfied with the options they've had for audience targeting. So in that particular instance, that perception, I think, is as much education and letting people know that, in fact, uh, you can geo-target, you can target uh, very precisely on uh, context and uh, and topic and and uh, interest areas and things like that. So again, I, I, I do think that's more of an education thing. We asked uh, current and previous buyers, what have you bought? Have you bought host red ads that were endorsed, not endorsed, announcer or producer red ads? Uh, or have you bought ad creatives that have been used on other audio platforms, largely AM, FM spots, I think. And uh, you know, for the most part, about the same percentage of buyers have, have used host red ads that are endorsed, announcer red ads, or reused creative. Uh, a minority here have used host red ads that are not endorsed. So those are certainly not as popular. Um, and when these buyers are picking a publisher, when they're buying these types of ads, again, whether they're host red or programmatic announcer red uh, from, from any stripe, which factors related to products and services when you're choosing a publisher are most important. Um, and this, I thought, was a really fascinating finding, because uh, especially when I break it down by brands and uh, brand side and agency side here in a moment. But number one on the list was quality of ad creative, even ahead of targeting, pricing, uh, attribution, measurement, and things like that. And again, this is in choosing a publisher partner. So a quality of ad creative was number one. And what's driving that is the agency side and more than half it's by far the number one answer on the agency side said that quality of ad creative was the most important factor when choosing a publishing partner um and, the only, and again the a couple of the differences here uh advertisers are much more likely to say offers audience targeting we just talked about that i think that's a thing that's uh again part of an education effort um and then Host red ads, uh, advertisers, especially those that buy direct, often buy host red ads from uh, directly from a show uh, or shows. So there's a, a little bit of a higher percentage there. Uh, but quality of ad creative being number one, especially with the agency side, I found really, really fascinating. And when we talked to our uh, our Sounds Profitable insiders, you know, one of the top things that we heard was if publishers can develop their sales teams as creative professionals, then brands can take advantage of more strategic campaigns. And I think this is a trend that uh, publishers and, and networks, I think, need to continue pursuing to develop creative services, to develop more, uh, more of an offering internally for creative uh, campaigns and executions that are really tied to the show or shows that they're working with, because I think that's absolutely, uh, that's a competitive advantage. And it also makes use of the medium in ways that simply rerunning uh, radio creative cannot do. Um, but the other thing in talking to the Sounds Profitable insiders just about creative and creativity, 
uh, and this was not something that uh, that we asked in the survey, but it really came out in in the qual, is that there is a tension around creativity where it comes to content and new podcasts and innovation and content, right? Uh, one insider said, I think having good content and quality content is super important. I think we've all seen a slowdown over the last 12 months of content being released, which hopefully means that our network partners are putting their heads together to release meaningful, good content. So there is a uh, there's a, a hue and cry amongst some of the real veteran buyers to get uh, more content innovation. And yet, as someone else said, there's been a concerted effort to scale back on top performers, uh, first and foremost, which has affected the ability to test new podcasts. For some brands, the bar has been set higher of what it takes to earn their money or earn that new opportunity. So on the one hand, there is a, a call for different content, new content to be able to work with, um, especially with creative ad executions. But on the other, uh, there's also a bit of a, a, a flight to comfort or a, a, a flight to safety uh, to some extent where we're in a... Uh, an economic, an economically uncertain environment, right? So I think, and we'll touch on that a little bit later on in the presentation. Now, when people are planning to buy or buying podcast ads, what are the main driving factors? What are they looking for? And I, I found this top one uh, kind of interesting, brand awareness at 51%. And again, the fact that brand awareness is number one here is really reflective of where we are with podcast buying and not necessarily where we're going to be um, because I don't, you know, with podcasting not reaching at scale the same number of people yet as things like uh, YouTube or radio and, and, and television and things like that, uh, brand awareness may not necessarily be the number one goal for a lot of buyers. But I think what you're seeing here now are the buyers that we have are very committed to podcasting. They are driving brand awareness, especially for those brands that have really made their name in podcasting that have focused on podcast buying, uh, they have absolutely been able to move the needle in brand awareness. So I don't know that that's going to be number one in the future. It's number one now. Um, and all I can say is that this is exactly the kind of study that we're going to repeat on a regular basis because this is kind of our report card, I think, as an industry. So when people are evaluating the uh, impact of a campaign, the impact of a spot, the efficacy of their efforts, what are the most important evaluation criteria? And this is kind of all over the map a little bit. Uh, statistically, the first three or four things are really kind of tied on in, in some uh, to some extent. But number one, brand lift. And uh, I do think we have some exceptional brand lift tools available. We have this, you know, the same kind of brand lift tools and, and opportunities for podcasting that many other media platforms are using today. So again, continuing to tell that story, I think is something that's very important for uh, both the vendor side and the publisher side. But, you know, that came out uh, just barely number one, uh, followed by unique audience delivery, ad impression delivery, and return on ad spend. As far as what delivery measurements people have used, People have used a variety of things here uh, in terms of what's available. Uh, people have used impression delivery, uh, listen or view verification, household uniques, downloads, you know, all kinds of things have been used. Um, and and again, just going back to one of the comments made by uh, one of our insiders, there's not necessarily one source of truth here. But I do think it's important to look at what's perceived by buyers as the most effective. And the top two answers here, number one, unique audience delivery at 26%. And then number two, listen or view verification, which on the one hand, uh, you don't always get. That's uh, platform specific, but it does give us uh, a goal to shoot for, or at least perceptually uh, in terms of what buyers are looking for, uh, something that's important to them. And, and that's something that we all, I think, have to grapple with. In terms of how that data is shared and how that data is transacted from brand to buyer, uh, to uh, to network and publisher. There are a couple of comments here about sharing that data. The main challenge on everybody's mind is transparency. It really falls on the brands to make sure that things are delivering in a way that's beneficial to the advertiser, and it shouldn't really fall on the brands. Uh, and another buyer said, the value of transparency and flexibility of networks has grown exponentially. We've started to open up the data with networks and show them how we can make this work. As a buyer, you have to weigh things by results. And if your ad reads aren't generating results for the brand, you can't keep justifying spending on it. So you have to ask for flexibility from your network partners. And there's some friction here both ways, I think. And as someone who has done a lot of brand lift research in my uh, previous career, 
it's absolutely frustrating to uh, to do a brand lift study that is specific to a major brand that is uh, advertising in multiple platforms uh, and produce podcast specific results and having that sort of disappear from my perspective into a black hole and not understanding uh, how did we do compared to the other omni-channel efforts that that brand is undertaking, right? Does this look good or bad compared to what that brand is doing uh, in television or in print and what are their expectations? So I think transparency both ways with that data um, is only going to make things better for us as we are able to, to better optimize campaigns and optimize creative for what we're doing. And another friction in data, I think, is uh, I think we need to do a better job fitting in to uh, more complex modeling and attribution here. Uh, and, and a couple of people noted this in our qualitative research. I think the reality is the bigger the brand, the more likely they're going to focus on things like marketing mix modeling or multi-touch attribution to determine that overall media mix. Uh, and then uh, and someone else pointed out here that third-party vendors are providing data that we can trust, but how do we ingest it? into our other media mix models. So again, knowing what podcasting's place is with all of the buyer's efforts is part of it. And then another part of it is on the on the ad tech side and on the on the reporting side, providing outputs to the brands, to the buyers that are that sort of easily sync up and integrate with all of their KPIs as they're looking at how all of their efforts are uh, fitting together and, and working together. So how have people purchased podcast ads uh, and kind of t largely tied here at the top are buying through Spotify directly or a direct buy with a publisher or ad network. Uh, and then you see a direct buy with a single podcast uh, nearly tied with a programmatic buy. And uh, as people are buying programmatic advertising, as people are continuing to buy uh, embedded or baked in uh, host red ads, we see a little friction here, and it's it's worth pointing a couple of these things out with veteran buyers. Uh, the people who have the most experience buying podcasting really been with it since the beginning and have really dealt with a lot of the things that I think from a, a tech standpoint and a reporting standpoint that we have asked them to do. Uh, but they, they continue to want to buy, uh, a lot of them, they continue to want to buy baked in host red ads. And some of the comments here, I don't hate dynamic. I think there's a lot to be done there, but for now, we do less than 5% of our overall budget on anything dynamic because for the most part, it hasn't been as effective. Programmatic is going to continue to grow because brands want to use it, and we have to figure out the right way to create the creative and serve the ads so they're not disruptive. Uh, and then I love this last comment. The challenge is that as we get more into impression-based selling and lower touch partnerships, we're cutting ourselves off at the knees. You can still create seismic impact by doing the right style buys with the right partners. So. Uh, Again, a, a common theme here uh, on the one hand uh, is having things like uh, having the ad tech keep pace with the growth in the industry and uh, in terms of uh, capabilities and, and reporting. But on the other hand, for the people that have been with buying podcasts from the very beginning that, that you know, want to buy it a certain way, uh, they've, you know, they've supported the industry tremendously. And, and if anything, we need to make it easier, not more difficult to do those kinds of buys. Amongst the people that are buying any programmatic advertising, it's really spread across the map here in terms of how much of their buy is dedicated to programmatic. And again, these are just the people currently buying programmatic ads and podcasting. No real trend here, uh, kind of all over the map. So uh, I think it's definitely uh, brand specific, creative specific, and, and not necessarily leaning one way or the other yet. Um, for the people who are not buying programmatically, why not? Uh, what would make them more likely to consider programmatic buying? Uh, and this is led by better or more audience targeting options, uh, which again, I think we're going to either catch up on or perhaps already have. Um, improved ad effectiveness, uh, more efficient pricing. Uh, I thought it was interesting that a third just said they need to know more about it. So, uh, you know, already you have a third of people not buying programmatic just saying, I, I really don't know enough about it. So that's uh, part of the education effort, I think, which I'll I'll talk about at the end. Um, but this one too, more control over content. And this is one of those friction points at the edges that I mentioned early on. The people currently buying are largely uh, happy about things like brand safety and brand suitability. But as we get to the edges with sort of the next group of brands, the next class of advertisers and buyers that we need to break into, 
we hear from our veteran buyers, there's definitely a place for programmatic, but we try to stay away from it because we don't feel super confident about brand safety. Um, and another, when allowing programmatic ads on your content, you don't know what's going to end up in your show. It's something to be cautious about in terms of brand safety. So I think in the evolution of what we're doing here, uh, you know, what got us here is great. What needs to get us there uh, is, I think, it increased options in terms of being able to utilize these tools in, in campaigns. Now, we also asked a few questions comparing podcasting and podcast advertising with some other media platforms that these buyers are using. Uh, majority of these buyers have also purchased streaming music and streaming TV, uh, and then somewhat fewer have purchased AM, FM radio and linear TV. And one of the questions that we asked was, uh, for all of these media, if you do buy these or if you have experience buying these and buying podcasting, what are your plans? You're going to spend more this year or less? And uh, for the most part, I think people are are not planning on spending less. Uh, to some extent, I think this might be aspirational. Uh, how I would read this is not um, reflective of a dollar amount, but I think reflective of an optimism that they will spend more this year than last year, which I think is probably not difficult to do given the period that we have been going through uh, in advertising. So, but that optimism is led by streaming music uh, and then podcasts. Uh, and I'll point out, by the way, that these were not recruited to be podcast buyers. These are the podcast buyers as it fell. And that's the case with this buyer sample. Uh, and then streaming TV, and then to somewhat lesser extent, uh, radio and linear TV. We asked a few uh, perceptual questions about brand awareness, returning on, uh, return on ad spend, and um, best measurement and attribution options. And a couple of things are clear here. Number one, podcasting is absolutely considered in the tier of streaming TV and streaming music. So it is perceived for all three of these as superior to AM, FM radio, and linear TV. But I think the other thing that's clear here is that there's a lot of love uh, for streaming music and streaming TV. And streaming TV, and let's let's throw YouTube in here, uh, was absolutely one of the topics that were that was brought up a lot by our our panel of insiders. And in some cases, that's down again to that flight to comfort that I talked about before. One of the big issues we've run into in terms of measurement is that more and more impressions are running on YouTube. We want to be transparent with our clients on how we measure conversions and measurement, so we ask them what percentage, on average, their show runs on YouTube. Um, and then sort of more related to what we just talked about. The promise of the tech has been amazing for the industry, but the implementation has actually been somewhat disastrous for many advertisers. And as a result, many advertisers are sprinting for the safety of YouTube and a more old school embedded approach. And then of course, video first trend uh, was brought up by a number of people. So uh, I think this is an area of future exploration. In fact, it's, uh, it's going to be on our roadmap that sounds profitable uh, very, very soon, I think. So last bit of data that I want to share with you before I get to some uh, recommendations and observations, why not podcasts? Now, I want to focus here on the people that have never bought podcast ads uh, or have bought them before, but are not buying them this year. First thing I'll point out, I showed you these perceptions earlier, uh, but I want to show you these perceptions, the differences between people buying ads this year and the people who are not currently buying podcast ads this year. And what's these are the uh, the perceptions that showed the biggest difference between current buyers and previous but not current buyers. Uh, and I'm just starting at the bottom here. The ad environment in podcasts is uncluttered. Podcasting is easy to buy. Again, we've we've talked about a little friction there. Podcast advertising is more engaging. Uh, but this top one had the biggest difference, a 15 percentage point difference between current buyers and lapsed buyers. I'm able to justify a podcasting spend through measured attribution. And this also, I think, may be an awareness issue. It also may be that uh, it's simply not possible on some campaigns. Let's get that out there. Uh, but you know, amongst people that are that are buying ads uh, or have bought them in the first place, about a third say they've never even used pixel-based attribution solutions. Uh, so again, that may be education. That may be that they're that they're working with publishers and campaigns that don't necessarily allow for that. But they're not. Uh, enjoying completely widespread use. Let's just say that. For the people that have previously bought but not buying this year, we asked them, why aren't you buying podcast ads in 2023? The top reason, and I'm going to come back to this, no demand 
from client brands or my brand. Just let's stick a pin in that for a moment. Uh, and then really kind of tied for a second here, previous performance, unsatisfactory, cost too high, lack of ad effectiveness or delivery measurement. And uh, in some cases, it may be that the delivery measurement uh, methods that were employed were unsatisfactory to the buyers. Uh, and in other cases, it may be that the, uh, as it says here, the previous performance was unsatisfactory. And look, I've worked on some brand lift studies for podcast campaigns that didn't work. Uh, they didn't work for a number of reasons. They didn't work because the uh, the creative execution didn't really match the content. They didn't work because the audiences didn't match. Uh, a crap ad is a crap ad. And, and sometimes you see that. Uh, and I think that's especially true when there's uh, not an effort to to really match the creative and the execution to the content, which is something that we talked about a little bit earlier. Now, amongst the people that have never bought podcast ads, uh, a couple that I want to focus on here uh, before we get to, I think, the, the ultimate reason, you know, first of all, lack of ad effectiveness, delivery measurement. These are people that have never bought podcast ads. Uh, it may be that they looked into them in the past. And I think if you looked into buying podcast ads five years ago, you may not have been satisfied with what you found in terms of uh, measurement and metrics. Things are different now, right? So that could be education. Uh, and insufficient targeting or demographic information, that's definitely an education and awareness effort. But ultimately, the number one reason why people have never purchased podcast ads, no demand, no demand from the client brands, no demand from my brand. And if you think about that, that means that the buyer uh, themselves has just not even considered it or the buyer themselves uh, the on the brand side is not asking their agency about it. And so that is an effort that as an industry, we have to tackle. And that really leads me to the observations and, and action steps, our marching orders, I think, for everybody on this uh, on this webinar, all 400 of you enjoying this hazy, hot, humid day with me. Uh, these are, I think, the marching orders for us in the industry to continue to push forward and make podcasting easier to buy, effective, and perceived uh, as one of the most valuable offerings, the most valuable arrows in the quiver. The first I just mentioned, we need a concerted industry effort to reintroduce podcasting to both the public and to brands. Honestly, podcasting has never been properly introduced to the mainstream public. Um, and brand marketers are part of that, right? Many brand marketers are simply unaware of the advances that podcasting technology, uh, that targeting and measurement, all of the things that we have done that we've made over the last five years. So I think that's uh, that's job number one for for many of us, I think, is is to get out there. I've spent a good part of this month giving presentations uh, in partnership with some of our partners at Sounds Profitable, presenting some of the advertising research work that we have done, getting in front of agencies. That is work that I will do until I lose my voice, which may be in the next 20 minutes. Uh, hopefully it recovers tomorrow. Uh, but that's voice. That's work I enjoy doing. That's work I want to continue to do. Uh, I will talk uh, until I'm blue in the face in front of agencies and buyers about uh, the research that we have done and about the power of advertising and podcasting. However, even with all the advances that we have made in ad tech and in measurement, some more experienced buyers are experiencing frustration with the tools available. They're bumping into things, right? Frequency capping, uh, they're bumping into things. Uh, the audience has grown enormously over the past five years, but for some, again, the friction at the edges, the technology available for targeting, measurement, and ad operations needs to grow with it for better integration from creative to campaign. We also, though, with all of that, as I mentioned before, uh, the people that that got us here by believing in the medium early on and buying the baked-in host-read ads, we need to make it easier for them to do that not more difficult for them to do that. Uh, we need to make it easier for people to buy this medium, no matter how they want to buy it. Uh, and that's especially true with the people that have uh, that we've asked for so much for so many years. Podcasting also needs more transparency and more sharing between publishers and agencies and brands, more data going back and forth around uh, key performance indicators, success metrics. We have to have better ways to evaluate how we are doing the role of podcasting in the context of larger MMM and MTA models across other platforms. We we deserve to know that information. It's how we're going to get better. I think the brand should want us to have that information because it's going to make their campaigns more effective. And that's something that we need to push for. Uh, many of the existing buyers, as I mentioned, have, you know, agree 
that they're satisfied with brand safety and brand suitability tools available to them. But there is a, a cohort, I think, of advertisers and buyers, the next tranche, if you will, uh, the next cohort of brands and advertisers that we would like to welcome into podcasting that really can't invest more in podcasting unless uh, they are they are aware of or satisfied with the solutions for protecting their brands. Uh, and then finally here, just a couple of quick points. Uh, we've revealed a few areas that I think warrant additional study. And that's certainly one of our focuses here at Sounds Profitable is to uncover these things, to, to provide them to you so that we can continue to push the space forward uh, to overcome or address potential objections to buying podcasting. Uh, you know, one that I pointed out earlier was uh, the prevalence and potential impact of ad skipping in podcasting compared to other ad supported media. I would love to to get some quality research put together that shows that. Like I said, it may not be completely front burner for us, but it's uh, it is on the stove. Uh, and also, I think, uh, and this is on our front burner. More work needs to be done to quantify the effects of podcasting in conjunction with online video and streaming TV to match the kind of work that we just did with our previous study, The Medium Moves the Message, where we compared the efficacy of podcast advertising with radio and TV. I think we need to take a look at online video and, and YouTube as well. Uh, I don't think YouTube has to defend themselves against podcasting in this way, uh, but we certainly, I think, can benefit from this kind of research because I think we would do very well in um, any project that we have put out there uh, is one that I have believed podcasting would look very well in, and and that's that's been true so far. Uh, and I want to end here with uh, just a, a mention of some of the previous things that we have done, because I would be remiss if I did not uh, mention in a clarion call to increase awareness and, and talk about what it is that we do, that we have put together a lot of work uh, that you can use to help tell the story, to really sing the song of podcasting to buyers. For the buyers who want to know more about the podcasters themselves, we have the creators for podcasters, uh, for buyers that are concerned about brand safety and suitability, we put out Safe and Sound uh, last year. Uh, for questions about host read versus scripted versus announcer read, we put out after these messages, and I still get those questions. Uh, and then our, our last project, The Medium Moves the Message, is really the first large scale comparative study of the effectiveness of podcast advertising versus broadcast advertising, who are all really in the same. 30 to, sec 30 to 60 second spot advertising game. So put all of that uh, in your sales kit. Uh, and then I'll close here by a couple of things. Uh, we are going to be putting out very soon the biggest study that we have ever done. Uh, it's going to be unveiled at uh, Podcast Movement. Uh, we think it's going to be the, the definitive study on audience growth. That's uh, That was really the next thing on our marching orders to, to take a look at, at, at what some of the inhibitors to audience growth are. So Look for that at Podcast Movement. Um, and I'll close here with, again, thanking our sponsors. Uh, thank you very much to Signal Hill and Digiday uh, for helping us on the research side of things. Uh, BetterHelp, SXM, Barometer, Wondery, Audiohook, NPR, ESPN Podcasts, uh, and Soundrise. Um, I'm going to take a, a, a quick scan to see here uh, if there are any quick questions. This will be available to download at our site uh, very, very soon. So don't see any, uh, quick questions in here. Uh, and then the, the last thing that I will add here, if you are a current sounds profitable partner, uh, join me in nine minutes, uh, as we do a, a little sounds profitable unplugged, uh, to kind of get behind the scenes here in this webinar. And, and hopefully all of our partners have that email. So, uh, I'm going to go have a drink of water, go to the bathroom, be back in a few minutes uh, to, to do that for our partners. But for everybody, uh, thank you so much for the gift of your time and attention. Again, we do this for you. We do this to remove barriers and obstacles. And I think this is an important study in that it is a report card. It's a, uh, my partner, Brian, called it a, uh, a performance report, I guess, or a performance review for the industry. And I think there's some very clear marching orders. So uh, I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, again, big shout out to, to Signal Hill for their uh, diligence and, and hard work on this to help us put this together. Uh, and thank you to Brian, Gavin, and Manuela back at uh, Sounds Profitable headquarters in the cloud, wherever that may be. Uh, and have a great day. And I'll see you on the road soon. Cheers.